Now, right to freedom of religion. Number one, freedom of conscience and free profession, practice and propagation of religion. Article 25 says that all persons are equally entitled to freedom of conscience and the right to freely profess, practice and propagate religion. The implications of these are A. Freedom of conscience. Inner freedom of an individual to mold his relation with God or creatures in whatever way he desires. B. Right to profess. Declaration of one's religious beliefs and faith openly and freely. C. Right to practice. Performance of religious worship, rituals, ceremonies and exhibition of beliefs and ideas. D. Right to propagate. Transmission and dissemination of one's religious beliefs to others or exposition of the tenets of one's religion. But it does not include a right to convert another person to one's own religion. Forcible conversions impinge on the freedom of conscience guaranteed to all the persons alike. From the above, it is clear that Article 25 covers not only religious beliefs, doctrines, but also religious practices, rituals. Moreover, these rights are available to all persons, citizens, as well as non-citizens. However, these rights are subject to public order, morality, health, and other provisions relating to fundamental rights. Further, the state is permitted to regulate or restrict any economic, financial, political, or other secular activity associated with religious practice and provide for social welfare and reform or throw open Hindu religious institution of a public character to all classes and sections of Hindus. Article 25 also contains two explanations. One, wearing and carrying of kirpans is to be included in the profession of the Sikh religion and two, the Hindus in this context include Sikhs, Jains and Buddhists. Number two, freedom to manage religious affairs. According to Article 26, Every religious denomination or any of its section shall have the following rights. A. Right to establish and maintain institution for religious and charitable purposes. B. Right to manage its own affairs in matters of religion. C. Right to own and acquire movable and immovable property. And D. Right to administer such property in accordance with law. Article 25 guarantees rights of individuals, while Article 26 guarantees rights of religious denominations or other sections. In other words, Article 26 protects collective freedom of religion. Like the rights under Article 25, the rights under Article 26 are also subject to public order, morality and health, but not subject to other provisions relating to the fundamental rights. The Supreme Court held that a religious denomination must satisfy three conditions. A. It should be a collection of individuals who have a system of beliefs which they regard as conducive to their spiritual well-being. B. It should have a common organization. And C. It should be designated by a distinctive name. Under the above criteria, the Supreme Court held that the Ramakrishna Mission and Ananda Marga are religious denominations within the Hindu religion. It also held that Aurobindo society is not a religious denomination. Number 3. Freedom from taxation for promotion of a religion. Article 27 lays down that no person shall be compelled to pay any taxes for the promotion or maintenance of any particular religion or religious denomination. In other words, the state should not spend the public money collected by way of tax for the promotion or maintenance of any particular religion. This provision prohibits the state from favoring, patronizing and supporting one religion over the other. This means that the taxes can be used for the promotion or maintenance of all religions. This provision prohibits only levy of a tax and not a fee. This is because the purpose of a fee is to control secular administration of religious institutions and not to promote or maintain religion. Thus, a fee can be levied on pilgrims to provide them some special service or safety measures. Similarly, a fee can be levied on religious endowments for meeting the regulation expenditure. Number 4. Freedom from attending religious instruction Under Article 28, no religious instruction shall be provided in any educational institution wholly maintained out of state funds. However, this provision shall not apply to an educational institution administered by the state but established under any endowment or trust requiring imparting of religious instruction in such institution. Further, no person attending any educational institution recognized by the state or receiving ad out of state funds shall be required to attend any religious instruction or worship in that institution without his consent. In case of a minor, the consent of his guardian is needed.
with us. Article 28 distinguishes between four types of educational institutions. A. Institutions wholly maintained by the state. B. Institutions administered by the state but established under any endowment or trust. C. Institutions recognized by the state. And D. Institutions receiving aid from the state. In A, religious instruction is completely prohibited, while in B, religious instruction is permitted. In C and D, religious instruction is permitted on a voluntary basis. Now, cultural and educational rights. Number 1. Protection of interests of minorities. Article 29 provides that any section of the citizens residing in any part of India having a distinct language, script or culture of its own shall have the right to conserve the same. Further, no citizen shall be denied admission into any educational institution maintained by the state or receiving aid out of state funds on grounds only of religion, race, caste or language. The first provision protects the right of a group while the second provision guarantees the right of a citizen as an individual irrespective of the community to which he belongs. Article 29 grants protection to both religious minorities as well as linguistic minorities. However, the Supreme Court held that the scope of this article is not necessarily restricted to minorities only, as it is commonly assumed to be. This is because of the use of words section of citizens in the article that include minorities as well as majority. The Supreme Court also held that the right to conserve the language includes the right to agitate for the protection of the language. Hence, the political speeches or promises made for the conservation of the language of a section of the citizens does not amount to corrupt practice under the Representation of the People Act 1951. Number 2. Right of minorities to establish and administer educational institutions. Article 30 grants the following rights to minorities, whether religious or linguistic. A. All minorities shall have the right to establish and administer educational institutions of their choice. B. The compensation amount fixed by the state for the compulsory acquisition of any property of a minority educational institution shall not restrict or abrogate the right guaranteed to them. This provision was added by the 44th Amendment Act of 1978 to protect the right of minorities in this regard. The Act deleted the right to property as a fundamental right, Article 31. C. In granting aid, the state shall not discriminate against any educational institution managed by a minority. Thus, the protection under Article 30 is confined only to minorities, religious or linguistic, and does not extend to any section of citizens as under Article 29. However, the term minority has not been defined anywhere in the Constitution. The right under Article 30 also includes the right of a minority to impart education to its children in its own language. Minority educational institutions are of three types. A. Institutions that seek recognition as well as add from the state b institution that seek only recognition from the state and not add and c institution that neither seek recognition nor add from the state the institutions of first and second type are subject to the regulatory power of the state with regard to syllabus prescription academic standards discipline sanitation employment of teaching staff and so on the institutions of third type are free to administer their affairs but subject to a operation of general laws like contract law, labor law, industrial law, tax law, economic regulations and so on. In a judgment delivered in the Secretary of Malankara Syrian Catholic College case 2007, the Supreme Court had summarized the general principles relating to establishment and administration of minority educational institutions in the following way. The right of minorities to establish and administer educational institutions of their choice comprises the following rights. 1. To choose its governing body in whom the founders of institution have faith and confidence to conduct and manage affairs of the institution. 2. To appoint teaching staff, teachers, lecturers and headmasters, principals as also non-teaching staff and to take if there is dereliction of duty on the part of any of its employees. 3. To admit eligible students of their choice and to set under reasonable fee structure. And 4. To use its properties and assets for the benefit of the institution. 2. 
the right conferred on minorities under Article 30 is only to ensure equality with the majority and not intended to place the minorities in a more advantageous position with or with the majority. There is no reverse discrimination in favor of minorities. The general laws of the land relating to national interest, national security, social welfare, public order, morality, health, sanitation, taxes and etc. applicable to all will equally apply to minority institutions also. The right to establish and administer educational institution is not absolute, nor does it include the right to maladminister. There can be regulatory measures for ensuring educational character and standards and maintaining academic excellence. There can be checks on administration as are necessary to ensure that the administration is efficient and sound so as to serve the academic needs of the institution. Regulations made by the state concerning generally the welfare of students and teachers, regulations laying down eligibility criteria and qualifications for appointment, as also conditions of service of employees, both teaching and non-teaching, regulations to prevent exploitation or operation of employees, and regulations prescribing syllabus and curriculum of study fall under this category. Such regulations do not in any manner interfere with the right under Article 30. One. Fourth, subject to the eligibility conditions or qualifications prescribed by the state being met, the unaided minority educational institutions will have the freedom to appoint teachers, lecturers by adopting any rational procedure of selection. 5. Extension of ad by the state does not alter the nature and character of the minority educational institutions. The conditions can be imposed by the state to ensure proper utilization of the ad without however diluting or abridging the right under Article 30. And part 1. Now, right to constitutional remedies. A mere declaration of fundamental rights in the constitution is meaningless useless and worthless without providing an effective machinery for their enforcement, if and when they are violated. Hence, Article 32 confers the right to remedies for the enforcement of the fundamental rights of an aggrieved citizen. In other words, the right to get the fundamental rights protected is in itself a fundamental right. This makes the fundamental rights real. That is why Dr. Ambedkar called Article 32 as the most important article of the Constitution, an article without which this Constitution would be a nullity. It is the very soul of the Constitution and the very heart of it. The Supreme Court has ruled that Article 32 is a basic feature of the Constitution. Hence, it cannot be abridged or taken away even by way of an amendment to the Constitution. It contains the following four provisions. A. The right to move the Supreme Court by appropriate proceedings for the enforcement of the fundamental rights is guaranteed. b. The Supreme Court shall have power to issue directions or orders or writs for the enforcement of any of the fundamental rights. The writs issued by may include habeas corpus, mandamus prohibition, certiorari and quo verento. c. Parliament can empower any other court to issue directions, orders and writs of all kinds. However, this can be done without prejudice to the above powers conferred on the Supreme Court. Any other court here does not include High Courts because Article 226 has already conferred these powers on the High Courts. D. The right to move the Supreme Court shall not be suspended except as otherwise provided for by the Constitution. Thus, the Constitution provides that the President can suspend the right to move any court for the enforcement of the fundamental rights during a national emergency, Article 359. It is thus clear that the Supreme Court has been constituted as the defender and guarantor of the fundamental rights of the citizens. It has been vested with the original and wide powers for that purpose. Original because an aggrieved citizen can directly go to the Supreme Court, not necessarily by way of appeal. Wide because its power is not restricted to issuing of orders or directions, but also rates of all kinds. The purpose of Article 32 is to provide a guaranteed, effective, expeditious, inexpensive and summary remedy for the protection of the fundamental rights. Only the fundamental rights guaranteed by the constitution can be enforced under Article 32 and not any other right like non-fundamental constitutional rights, statutory rights, customary rights and so on. 
The violation of a fundamental right is the sine qua non for the exercise of the right conferred by Article 32. In other words, the Supreme Court under Article 32 cannot determine a question that does not involve fundamental rights. Article 32 cannot be invoked simply to determine the constitutionality of an executive order or a legislation unless it directly infringes any of the fundamental rights. In case of the enforcement of fundamental rights, the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court is original but not exclusive. It is concurrent with the jurisdiction of the High Court under Article 226. It vests original powers in the High Court to issue directions, orders and writs of all kinds for the enforcement of the fundamental rights. It means when the fundamental rights of a citizen are violated, the aggrieved party has the option of moving either the High Court or the Supreme Court directly. Since the right guaranteed by Article 32, that is the right to move the Supreme Court where a fundamental right is infringed, is in itself a fundamental right. The availability of alternate remedy is no bar to relief under Article 32. However, the Supreme Court has ruled that where relief through High Court is available under Article 2 to 6, the aggrieved party should first move the High Court. Now, writs, types, and scope. The Supreme Court under Article 32 and the High Courts under Article 2 to 6 can issue the writs of habeas corpus, mandamus prohibition, certiorari, and quo verento. Further, the Parliament under Article 32 can empower any other court to issue these writs. Since no such provision has been made so far, only the Supreme Court and the High Courts can issue the writs and not any other court. Before 1950, only the High Courts of Calcutta, Bombay and Madras had the power to issue the writs. Article 226 now empowers all the High Courts to issue the writs. These writs are borrowed from English law where they are known as prerogative writs. They are so called in England as they were issued in the exercise of the prerogative of the king who was and is still described as the fountain of justice. Later, the High Court started issuing these writs as extraordinary remedies to uphold the rights and liberties of the British people. The writ jurisdiction of the Supreme Court differs from that of a High Court in three respects. 1. The Supreme Court can issue writs only for the enforcement of fundamental rights, whereas a High Court can issue writs not only for the enforcement of fundamental rights, but also for any other purpose. The expression for any other purpose refers to the enforcement of an ordinary legal right. Thus, the writ jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in this respect is narrower than that of High Court. 2. The Supreme Court can issue writs against a person or government throughout the territory of India, whereas a High Court can issue writs against a person residing or against a government or authority located within its territorial jurisdiction only, or outside its territorial jurisdiction only if the cause of action arises within its territorial jurisdiction. Thus, the territorial jurisdiction of the Supreme Court for the purpose of issuing writs is wider than that of a High Court. A remedy under Article 32 is in itself a fundamental right and hence the Supreme Court may not refuse to exercise its writ jurisdiction. On the other hand, a remedy under Article 2 to 6 is discretionary and hence a High Court may refuse to exercise its writ jurisdiction. Article 32 does not merely confer power on the Supreme Court as Article 2 to 6 does on High Court to issue writs for the enforcement of fundamental rights or other rights as part of its general jurisdiction. The Supreme Court is thus constituted as a defender and guarantor of the fundamental rights. Now we will proceed to understand the meaning and scope of different kinds of writs mentioned in Articles 32 and 226 of the Constitution. The first one is habeas corpus. It is a Latin term which literally means to have the body of. It is an order issued by the court to a person who has detained another person to produce the body of the latter before it. The court then examines the cause and legality of detention. It would set the detained person free. If the detention is found to be illegal, thus this writ is a bulwark of individual liberty against arbitrary detention. The writ of habeas corpus can be issued against both public authorities as well as private individuals. The writ, on the other hand, is not issued where the detention is lawful. B. The proceeding is for contempt of a legislature or a court. C. Detention is by a competent court. And D. Detention is outside the jurisdiction of the court. The second one is mandamus. It literally means we command. It is a command issued by the court to a public official asking him to perform his official duties that he has failed or refused to perform. 
It can also be sued against any public body or corporation, an inferior court, a tribunal or government for the same purpose. The writ of mandamus cannot be issued a against a private individual or body, b to enforce departmental instruction that does not possess statutory force, c when the duty is discretionary and not mandatory, d to enforce a contractual obligation, e against the president of India or the state governors, and f against the chief justice of a high court acting in judicial capacity. The third one is prohibition. Literally, it means to forbid. It is issued by a higher court to a lower court or tribunal to prevent the latter from exceeding its jurisdiction or unsurping a jurisdiction that it does not possess. Thus, unlike mandamus that directs activity, the prohibition directs inactivity. The writ of prohibition can be issued only against judicial and quasi-judicial authorities. It is not available against administrative authorities, legislative bodies, and private individuals or bodies. The fourth one is certio rari. In the literal sense, it means to be certified or to be informed. It is issued by a higher court to a lower court or tribunal either to transfer a case pending with the latter to itself or to squash the order of the latter in a case. It is issued on the grounds of excess of jurisdiction or lack of jurisdiction or error of law. Thus, unlike prohibition, which is only preventive, certiorari is both preventive as well as curative. Previously, the writ of certiorari could be issued only against judicial and quasi-judicial authorities and not against administrative authorities. However, in 1991, the Supreme Court ruled that the certiorari can be issued even against administrative authorities affecting rights of individuals. Like prohibition, certiorari is also not available against legislative bodies and private individuals or bodies. The fifth one is quo warranto. In the literal sense, it means by what authority or warrant. It is issued by the court to inquire into the legality of claim of a person to a public office. Hence, it prevents illegal usurpation of public office by a person. The writ can be issued only in case of a substantive public office of a permanent character created by a statute or by the constitution. It cannot be issued in cases of ministerial office or private office. Unlike the other four writs, this can be sought by any interested person and not necessarily by the aggrieved person. Now, Armed Forces and Fundamental Rights Article 33 empowers the Parliament to restrict or abrogate the fundamental rights of the members of armed forces, paramilitary forces, police forces, intelligence agencies and analogous forces. The objective of this provision is to ensure the proper discharge of their duties and the maintenance of discipline among them. The power to make laws under Article 33 is conferred only on Parliament and not on state legislatures. Any such law made by Parliament cannot be challenged in any court on the ground of contravention of any of the fundamental rights. Accordingly, the Parliament has enacted the Army Act 1950, the Navy Act 1950, the Air Force Act 1950, the Police Forces Restriction of Rights Act 1966, the Border Security Force Act and so on. These impose restrictions on their freedom of speech, right to form associations, right to be members of trade unions or political associations, right to communicate with the press, right to attend public meetings or demonstrations, etc. This is a table 7.3 which is showing martial law versus national emergency. You can see martial law and national emergency. Number one, it affects only fundamental rights. But national emergency affects not only fundamental rights but also center-state relations, distribution of revenues and legislative powers between center and states and may extend the tenure of the parliament. Number two, it suspends the government and ordinary law courts. But national emergency continues the government and ordinary law courts. Martial law is imposed to restore the breakdown of law and order due to any region. But national emergency can be imposed only on three grounds, war, external aggression, and armed rebellion. Martial law is imposed in some specific area of the country. But national emergency is imposed either in the whole country or in any part of it. Fifth one, the martial law has no specific provision in the constitution. It is implicit. But national emergency has a specific and detailed provision in the constitution. It is explicit. The expression members of the armed forces also covers such employees of the armed forces as barbers, carpenters, mechanics, cooks, chokidars, bootmakers, tailors who are non-combatants. A parliamentary law enacted under Article 33 can also exclude the court martial tribunals established under the military law from the rich jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and the High Courts. 
so far as the enforcement of fundamental rights is concerned. Now, martial law and fundamental rights. Article 34 provides for the restrictions on fundamental rights while martial law is in force in any area within the territory of India. It empowers the parliament to indemnify any government servant or any other person for any act done by him in connection with the maintenance or restoration of order in any area where martial laws was in force. The parliament can also validate any sentence, passed, punishment inflicted, forfeiture ordered or other act done under martial law in such area. The act of indemnity made by the parliament cannot be challenged in any court on the ground of contravention of any of the fundamental rights. The concept of martial law has been borrowed in India from the English common law. However, the expression martial law has not been defined anywhere in the constitution. Literally, it means military rule. It refers to a situation where civil administration is run by the military authorities according to their own rules and regulations framed outside the ordinary law. It thus implies the suspension of ordinary law and the government by military tribunals. It is different from the military law that is applicable to the armed forces. There is also no specific or express provision in the constitution that authorizes the executive to declare martial law. However, it is implicit in Article 34 under which martial law can be declared in any area within the territory of India. The martial law is imposed under the extraordinary circumstances like war, invasion, insurrection, rebellion, riot or any violent resistance to law. Its justification is to repel force by force for maintaining or restoring order in the society. During the operation of martial law, the military authorities are vested with abnormal powers to take all necessary steps. They impose restrictions and regulations on the rights of the civilians, can punish the civilians and even condemn them to death. The Supreme Court held that the declaration of martial law does not ipso facto result in the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. The declaration of a martial law under Article 34 is different from the declaration of a national emergency under Article 352. The differences between the two are summarized in Table 7.3, which we have already discussed. Now, Effecting Certain Fundamental Rights Article 35 lays down that the power to make laws to give effect to certain specified fundamental rights shall vest only in the parliament and not in the state legislatures. This provision ensures that there is uniformity throughout India with regard to the nature of those fundamental rights and punishment for their infringement. In this direction, Article 35 contains the following provisions. 1. The Parliament shall have and the legislature of a state shall not have the power to make laws with respect to the following matters. a. Prescribing residence as a condition for certain employments or appointments in a state or union territory or local authority or other authority. Article 16 b. Empowering courts other than the Supreme Court and the High Courts to issue directions, orders and writs of all kinds for the enforcement of fundamental rights. Article 32 c. Restricting or abrogating the application of fundamental rights to members of armed forces, police forces, etc. Article 33 d. Indemnifying any government servant or any other person for any act done during the operation of martial law in any area. Article 34 2. Parliament shall have and the legislature of a state shall not have powers to make laws for prescribing punishment for those acts that are declared to be offences under the fundamental rights. These include the following a. Untouchability Article 17 b. Traffic in human beings and forced labour Article 23 Further, the Parliament shall after the commencement of the constitution make laws for prescribing punishment for the above acts, thus making it obligatory on the part of the Parliament to enact such laws. Three. Any law in force at the commencement of the constitution with respect to any of the matters specified above is to continue in force until altered or repealed or amended by the parliament. It should be noted that article 35 extends the competence of the parliament to make a law on the matters specified above, even though some of those matters may fall within the sphere of the state legislatures, that is state list. Now, present position of right to property. Originally, the right to property was one of the seven fundamental rights under Part 3 of the Constitution. It was dealt by Article 19.1 F and Article 31. Article 19.1 F guaranteed to every citizen the right to acquire, hold and dispose of property. Article 31, on the other hand, guaranteed to every person, whether citizen or non-citizen, right against deprivation of his property. It provided that no person shall be deprived of his property except by authority of law. 
it empowered the state to acquire or requisition the property of a person on two conditions a it should be for public purpose and b it should provide for payment of compensation amount to the owner since the commencement of the constitution the fundamental right to property has been the most controversial it has caused confrontation between the supreme court and the parliament it has led to a number of constitutional amendments that is first 4th, 7th, 25th, 39th, 40th and 42nd amendments. Through these amendments, Articles 31A, 31B and 31C have been added and modified from time to time to nullify the effect of Supreme Court judgments and to protect certain laws from being challenged on the grounds of contravention of fundamental rights. Most of the litigation centered around the obligation of the state to pay compensation for acquisition or requisition of private property. Therefore, the 44th Amendment Act of 1978 abolished the right to property as a fundamental right by repealing Article 19 1F and Article 31 from Part 3. Instead, the Act inserted a new Article 300A in Part 12 under the heading Right to Property. It provides that no person shall be deprived of his property except by authority of law. Thus, the right to property still remains a legal right or a constitutional right though no longer a fundamental right. It is not a part of the basic structure of the constitution. The right to property as a legal right, as distinct from the fundamental rights, has the following implications. A. It can be regulated, that is curtailed, abridged or modified without constitutional amendment by an ordinary law of the parliament. B. It protects private property against executive action but not against legislative action. C. In case of violation, the aggrieved person cannot directly move the Supreme Court under Article 32, right to constitutional remedies, including writs, for its enforcement. He can move the High Court under Article 226. D. No guaranteed right to compensation in case of acquisition or requisition of the private property by the state. Though the fundamental right to property under Part 3 has been abolished, the Part 3 still carries two provisions which provide for the guaranteed right to compensation in cases of acquisition or requisition of the private property by the state. These two cases where compensation has to be paid are a. When the state acquires the property of a minority educational institution, Article 30, and when the state acquires the land held by a person under its personal cultivation and the land is within the statutory ceiling limits, Article 31a. The first provision was added by the 44th Amendment Act, 1978, while the second provision was added by the 17th Amendment Act, 1964. Further, Articles 31A, 31B and 31C have been retained as exceptions to the fundamental rights. Now, exceptions to fundamental rights. 1. Saving of laws providing for acquisition of estates, etc. Article 31A saves five categories of laws from being challenged and invalidated on the ground of contravention of the fundamental rights conferred by Article 14, equality before law and equal protection of laws. And Article 19, protection of six rights in respect of speech, assembly, movement, etc. They are related to agricultural land, reforms, industry and commerce and include the following. A. Acquisition of states and related rights by the state. Taking over the management of properties by the state. C. Amalgamation of corporations. D. Extinguishment or modification of rights of directors or shareholders of corporations. And E. Extinguishment or modification of mining leases. Article 31A does not immunize a state law from judicial review unless it has been reserved for the president's consideration and has received his assent. This article also provides for the payment of compensation at market value when the state acquires the land held by a person under its personal cultivation and the land is within the statutory ceiling limit. 2. Validation of certain acts and regulations. Article 31b saves the acts and regulations included in the ninth schedule from being challenged and invalidated on the ground of contravention of any of the fundamental rights. Thus. The scope of Article 31b is wider than Article 31a. Article 31b immunizes any law included in the ninth schedule from all the fundamental rights whether or not the law falls under any of the five categories specified in Article 31a. However, in a significant judgment delivered in I.R. Coelho case 2007, the Supreme Court ruled that there could not be any blanket immunity from judicial review of laws included in the ninth schedule. The court held that judicial review is a basic feature of the constitution and it could not be taken away by putting a law under the ninth schedule. 
It said that the laws placed under the 9th schedule after April 24, 1973 are open to challenge in court if they violated fundamental rights guaranteed under Article 14, 15, 19 and 21 or the basic structure of the constitution. It was on April 24, 1973 that the Supreme Court first propounded the doctrine of basic structure or basic features of the constitution in its landmark verdict in the case of Ananda Bharti case. Originally, in 1951, the 9th schedule contained only 13 acts and regulations, but at present in 2016, their number is 282, 282. Of these, the acts and regulations of the state legislature deal with land reforms and abolition of the Jamindari system and that of the parliament deal with other matters. 3. Saving of laws giving effect to certain directive principles. Article 31C, as inserted by the 25th Amendment Act of 1971, contained the following two provisions. A. No law that seeks to implement the socialistic directive principle as specified in Article 39B or C shall be void on the ground of contravention of the fundamental rights conferred by Article 14, equality before law and equal protection of laws, or Article 19, protection of six rights in respect of speech, assembly, movement, etc. B. No law containing a declaration that it is for giving effect to such policy shall be questioned in any court on the ground that it does not give effect to such a policy. In the case of Ananda Bharti case, 1973, the Supreme Court declared the above second provision of Article 31C as unconstitutional and invalid on the ground that judicial review is a basic feature of the constitution and hence cannot be taken away. However, the above first provision of Article 31C was held to be constitutional and valid. The 42nd Amendment Act 1976 extended the scope of the above first provision of Article 31C by including within its protection any law to implement any of the directive principles as specified in Part 4 of the Constitution and not merely in Article 39B or C. However, this extension was declared as unconstitutional and invalid by the Supreme Court in the Minerva Mills case 1980. Now, Criticism of Fundamental Rights The Fundamental Rights enshrined in Part 3 of the Constitution, have met with a wide and varied criticism. The arguments of the critics are number 1. Excessive limitations. They are subjected to innumerable exceptions, restrictions, qualifications and explanations. Hence, the critics remarked that the Constitution grants fundamental rights with one hand and takes them away with the other. Jaspat Roy Kapoor went to the extent of saying that the chapter dealing with the fundamental rights should be renamed as Limitations on Fundamental Rights or Fundamental Rights and Limitations Theorem. Number 2. No Social and Economic Rights The list is not comprehensive as it mainly consists of political rights. It makes no provision for important social and economic rights like right to social security, right to work, right to employment, right to rest and leisure and so on. These rights are made available to the citizens of advanced democratic countries. Also, the socialistic constitutions of erstwhile USSR or China provided for such rights. Number 3. No clarity. They are stated in a vague, indefinite and ambiguous manner. The various phrases and words used in the chapter like public order, minorities, reasonable restriction, public interest and so on are not clearly defined. The language used to describe them is very complicated and beyond the comprehension of the common man. It is alleged that the constitution was met by the lawyers for the lawyers. Sir Ivor Jennings called the constitution of India a paradise for lawyers. Number 4. No permanency. They are not sacrosanct or immutable as the parliament can curtail or abolish them, as for example the abolition of the fundamental right to property in 1978. Hence, they can become a play tool in the hands of politicians having majority support in the parliament. The judicially innovated doctrine of basic structure is the only limitation on the authority of parliament to curtail or abolish the fundamental right. Number 5. Suspension during emergency. The suspension of their enforcement during the operation of national emergency except articles 20 and 21 is another blot on the efficacy of these rights. This provision cuts at the roots of democratic system in the country by placing the rights of the millions of innocent people in the continuous geopardy. According to the critics, the fundamental rights should be enjoyable in all situations, emergency or no emergency. Number 6. Expensive remedy. The judiciary has been made responsible for defending and protecting these rights against the interference of the legislatures and executives. However, the judicial process is too expensive and hinders the common man from getting his rights enforced through the courts. Hence, the critics say that the rights benefit mainly the rich section of the Indian society.
नंबर सेवन प्रिवेंटिव डिटेंशन द क्रिटिक्स एज अर्ट दैट द प्रोविजन फॉर प्रिवेंटिव डिटेंशन आर्टिकल ट्वेंटी टू टेक्स अवे द स्पीरिट एंड सब्सटेंस ऑफ द चैप्टर ऑन फंडामेंटल राइट्स इट कन्फर्स आर्बिट्ररी पावर्स ऑन द स्टेट एंड निगेट्स इंडिविजुअल लिबर्टी इट जस्टिफाइज द क्रिटिसिजम दैट द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन ऑफ इंडिया डील्स मोर विद द राइट्स ऑफ द स्टेट अगेंस्ट द इंडिविजुअल दैन विद द राइट्स ऑफ द इंडिविजुअल अगेंस्ट द स्टेट notably no democratic country in the world has made preventive detention as an integral part of the constitutions as has been made in india number 8 no consistent philosophy according to some critics the chapter on fundamental rights is not the product of any philosophical principle sir ivor jennings expressed this view when he said that the fundamental rights proclaimed by the indian constitution are based on no consistent philosophy the critics say that this creates a difficult difficulty for the supreme court and the high courts in interpreting the fundamental rights now significance of fundamental rights in spite of the above criticism and shortcomings the fundamental rights are significant in the following respects number 1 they constitute the bedrock of democratic system in the country number 2 they provide necessary conditions for the material and moral protection of man number 3 they serve as a formidable bulwark of individual liberty number 4 they facilitate the establishment of rule of law in the country number 5 they protect the interests of minorities and weaker sections of society number 6 they strengthen the secular fabric of the indian state number 7 they check the absoluteness of the authority of the government number 8 they lay down the foundation stone of social equality and social justice number 9 they ensure the dignity and respect of individuals number 10 they facilitate the participation of people in the political and administrative process now rights outside part 3 besides the fundamental rights included in part 3 there are certain other rights contained in other parts of the constitution these rights are known as constitutional rights or legal rights or non fundamental rights they are one no tax shall be levied or collected except by authority of law article 265 in part 12 number 2 no person shall be deprived of his property save by authority of law article 300a in part 12 number 3 trade commerce and intercourse throughout the territory of india shall be free article 301 in part 12 30 even though the above rights are also equally justiciable they are different from the fundamental rights in case of violation of a fundamental right the aggrieved person can directly move the supreme court for its enforcement under article 32 which is in itself a fundamental right but in case of violation of the above rights the aggrieved person cannot avail this constitutional remedy he can move the high court by an ordinary suit or article 226 writ jurisdiction of high court now we have table 7.4 which is showing articles related to fundamental rights at a glance you can see here general the right to equality the right to freedom the right against exploitation the right to freedom of religion then cultural and educational rights the right to property which is repealed then saving of certain laws the right to constitutional remedies and then notes and references so with this our chapter ends and in the next video we will read the next chapter so till then listen to the audio books and study well Thank you